Good morning and welcome back to the Beef and Barney Show. We are live from, well, multiple destinations as usual. I'm from the Villages and as usual, the Lean Beef part of the show coming to you live from the greater Austin metropolitan area. Or, or you, as it's known as and in town, Wes Malotz. <laughs> yeah, Wes is hometown, right. Yeah. Um, um yeah. So, so what's been going on? Uh, you uh, you did some bowling yesterday. Um, we did a little bit. I would say that there was a overall a pretty good start. If I told you you were in seventh, a pretty mortifying start. If I told you 170 behind Norm Duke after six games. <laughs> yeah. It, uh, well, I'm getting used to it. I was about that many behind Pete last week. So, uh, you know, um, yeah, I got a little little learning curve to do on the uh, on the ratios. It's uh, it, it's a little more than what I've been. I showed up and bowled like I uh, like I wasn't ready to bowl at nine in the morning, and uh, got to a little slow start. I was plus ten after two, got to one seventy over uh, mostly the last two games, and uh, I was not within shouting distance. Uh, Norm's in first place at three hundred eighty four over after six. He is a eighty ahead of second. And and another fifty ahead of third. So uh, we are officially bowling for four spots with the tournament uh, about fifteen percent of the way over. <laughs> and uh, I guess it's possible he might not lead, but it, it would be a shock of epic proportions if he didn't end up uh, somewhere somewhere in the top, probably two or three at this point already. It's uh, it, I don't know how he does it. I uh, can't get my eyes to shift from from relatively flat patterns to relatively not so flat patterns. People talked about high, how high scoring the U.S. Open was. Uh, not even a starter kit. So uh, <laughs> these are so yeah. I mean, here you, when you miss left, you actually you just you just go light. Asymmetrical oh, balls, Christopher. Asymmetrical balls. Yeah, yeah. We're on our way to drill up some leverage. You know, put some leverage drillings and three inch pins and some balls here pretty soon to, uh, to, uh, yeah, new world, new tour. There we go. But, uh, yeah, Norm, still being Norm, he's doing those things. Uh, you bowled over the weekend as well, right? No, I actually took the weekend off. Um, I wanted to go up and see our friends at South Plains Lanes in mm -hmm. uh, Lubbock, but unfortunately, the city of Lubbock. Uh, decided it wanted to host everything that's ever lived this weekend. So the uh, <laughs> the room yeah. and board was somewhat out of my price range. Um, so I gave it a miss. I had a pretty nice weekend at home. Uh, we had big plans to paint a room. Well, we bought the paint. Uh, that's as close I, as we got to actually painting it. I, I'm not judging. I'm just saying. Yeah. Uh, best laid plans. You know, so yeah, yeah, uh, pretty much. So uh, it went fairly well for him. Uh, yeah, him and him and uh, Joey G, uh, another yeah, third place the, finish. They're the new Bill and Belmo. Yeah, I, they <laughs> they put it together a little bit. The kid that actually pulled his weight in qualifying, and then uh, Joey pulled good in, in match play and got him through and. Uh, they are team ham and egg. They they don't do much of anything the same, and and they complement each other. It seems like they don't have a lot of bad games because somebody's always one or the other is throwing a pretty big one. So uh, yeah, that's a that's always a, a good deal until the scores are really high, and then it's what like what happened to me and you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and that's basically what happened. He they ran a couple southpaws, and uh, for all those who watched Jacob at South Plains, it is no shock. But uh, the guys they bowled shot. 568 the first game and uh, both had the front five or six the second game. We were pretty much trolling them. They, uh, the kids were kids and reacted a little bit to uh, the beating they were receiving and uh, they did what they were supposed to do. They basically uh, fed into it and <laughs> put them on tilt. And so life lessons learned. Well, we've all been there. It, it's I've not really been. about being a kid. It's just more about being right-handed. Yeah, that's probably true. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not any better now, so I. No. Was, a lot of our conversations about being better than me about that stuff. So, <laughs> uh, right. Um, so 
Let's uh, like quickly uh, recaps for the playoffs. I went three and one, even though I should have gone two and two because I'm still trying to work out how Bill O'Neill managed to win that match. Um, <laughs> Jacob's just in a bit of a funk at the minute. Um, he manages to find a way, whether it's his fault, that match, or not his fault, Doherty match, or just a combination of the two, the Masters, to just about lose um it sucks i hope i hope for him that he figures out a way to get out of it because it really does suck when you're in that situation we've all we've all had those kind of runs where either the guy just says thanks or you say here you go and he says thanks but uh the one way to avoid those kind of runs is basically just not make a lot of shows but uh yeah. yeah Financially, so, that's not a good way of going about it. No, no, it's way, it's way better to lose on those shows than than not than not play. But uh, yeah, it's, it can be incredibly frustrating while it's going on. Uh, um, somebody bringing up that they still can't believe you lost by eleven, shooting two eighty nine. Yeah, um, I guess I should have tried a little harder. That would have been uh, a little ouch. bit a little cool to shoot two ninety and uh, lose with only a stone eight. Oh, I thought you were talking about the first frame. You should have tried a little harder. <laughs> That's all I had. That's a, I, I threw. Uh, yeah, the second frame was the only one that wasn't ten back. I haven't had a game like that in forever. I've had a lot of bigger, you know, three hundreds that weren't even anywhere close to as good a ball through the pins as that was. But uh, uh, Mike Bull, great too. It wasn't like he. It wasn't like I got done. I went, oh my god, I can't believe he tried the four and rolled yeah. the ten. I mean, it was flush, flush, flush. I, Sound like from at least the fourth or fifth on, he didn't ever do anything but go 10 back too. So, yeah. And then, um, quick little rundown uh, Thomas Larson um, pretty much drilled Simonson, uh, used the phase two, I believe. Um, 270, 270. That was nice. Awesome. <laughs> when you're on the receiving end of it. Um, bravo, Thomas. Let's bring some more of that for the Weber Cup. Um, uh, hey, easy there with that stuff. Uh, Frankie. Shout, shout out for the biggest guy in the chat today. All right. Uh, Frankie uh, used the phase two also um, in getting his match against Dick Allen. Um, squad, Adam. Yeah. Yeah, I, I guess. Yeah. What was your take on uh, – on, on Randy's commentary about Simo. Um, I knew I was going to ask this question. <laughs> I felt like Randy had a poor choice of words for the subject. But I felt like some of the things he was saying weren't unreasonable. At the same time, I don't necessarily know that the TV show is the part that that should be being brought up. So I don't necessarily think that what he was saying was completely out of bounds. I did think it might have been a little over the top for the TV show because you don't see you don't see in other sports when athletes are not doing what you would hope they, they, were, they would do. We've all been frustrated. And I think that Simo is in a little bit of a rut at the minute in that he's getting very frustrated by things that don't necessarily help him, which, I mean, me and you have never been guilty of that. Nope. Um, nope. Our glass house is completely uh, stone free. So, And I think that when he's on TV, I think that when he gets frustrated by that, I don't necessarily think it helps him. But I do think that it isn't – like people are making it sound like, oh, my God, can you believe he does this? Like he's never going to fulfill his potential doing that. Well, I don't think that it really hurts him during the week because he has a time where he's very frustrated, but he gets it out and he vents. And maybe mm -hmm. that five frames, it isn't as good. But after that, he, he feels like he – like, you know, it's me against the world again. And then he kind of builds up the rhythm because he's clearly not doing very badly in the tournaments, is he? Because you keep seeing him on TV. Right. And and there's been a lot of players that have used that kind of anger to focus themselves and get themselves uh, to be a little bit better. And, 
and at least perce perceptually, it, it makes them feel better. And uh, it served Pete okay over the years, I'd say. Yeah. Um, and the rack thing, myself, I, I think that is purely a thing. If he's in a bowling center now and he does work on those machines, most of us just complain about it, but actually don't know two things about how to actually fix them and just mm -hmm. think it's ridiculous. They're not like that, but we don't really know the work. Well, he actually does. And so he, more than most of us, he's willing to do the work in a place that's mostly a recreational center and feels like 100% for a professional tour that that should be a given. And yeah. it's just not right now. And I don't know that I disagree with him. Is it a little much? Probably, but it's a world he he's walking that walk, and so it's it's a it's an issue because he does it himself, and I think that gives him a little bit more credibility. Yeah, and like and like I say, I I think that I think that the criticism, the extreme criticism on both sides, is probably a little unwarranted. So yeah, yeah. like the people who are like making it sound like you know. How dare Randy talk about Simo like that? Probably a little over the top. And Randy was probably a little bit too far the other way. But Simo's been in Simo's been in a situation where he's been a little frustrated for the last, you know. Yeah. It's it's a repeat of offender and that and that makes a bigger deal. You know, Randy's had a one off. There's lots of guys that have had a one off. You know, the things have distracted them, slash frustrated them, slash had a moment they'd like to take back. I think almost anyone who's made very many shows has probably had a moment they'd like to take back at some point. But, uh, yeah, he has such a big influence. If you're a Simo fan, you hated that. And if you're a Simo hater, you thought it was about time and <laughs> and thought and it was that, very and, and and that, that's part of Randy's job, too. So don't underestimate that, that he's just doing what he's paid to do as well and to create opinions. So, mm -hmm. and Simo is becoming the next generation of a guy that you're going to have an opinion about one way or the other. A hundred percent. And we've just spent five minutes talking about it when it was largely irrelevant. <laughs> so there you go. There we are. So it is. Um, thing. Uh, all right. Well, let's get on to, uh, let, let, let's get on to the reason why we're here. Um, yeah, this is the real thing. So and well, grip. <clears throat> Let's start with Roto Grip because that's the easy one to start with. We've got new apparel on the website. Here's one of the shirts. Um, I kind of like this one. When we were, we actually saw this one being birthed, so to speak, when we were down at one of our sponsors. So um, this is a pretty cool shirt. It's got the old school Roto Grip logo on the side. The established fifty five. I think just to uh, just to remind Storm that you know. Were the grandpa in this whole situation? Um, I got a couple of shirts. I got a, um, uh, they call it a crew neck. Um, this one's kind of cool. It's um, it's like a t shirt jersey material with the squad RG on the front. This nice. is kind of cool. I might steal this idea for our, some of our shirts with the roto grip down the uh, spine. Again, we've got the old school roto grip on the sleeve. So if you check out rotogrip.com, and uh, click on the apparel situation. Um, there is quite a few new things up on the website. I just got a couple of uh, a couple of pieces to show you guys. Um, these, if you're a bigger guy, don't be afraid of the crew neck. Um, it runs plenty long enough for you to be able to tuck it in. Um, so, uh, yeah, every, every, everything's looking uh, pretty cool on the website. Um, yes, I would say they do run fairly true to size. The only thing I would say is, is the crew necks are kind of uh, maybe run a little bit long. Um, so yeah, definitely. Um, I'm wearing a two XL in this t-shirt. It seems like it's maybe slightly on the, you know, looser side, but of course still got to wash them. Uh, Jake, yeah. it's usually a couple of weeks. Um, I will uh, investigate for you, and I'll send you a message. Uh, that's super old school, Paul. <laughs> your mom. I'm I'm an old enough. I wore those, so I, I can uh, fully embrace uh, that uh, technology. Let's just call it of the time. Uh, 
Uh, Global also has new apparel uh, and a new uh, revamped logo that I like, and it's at home, which I have not been at in a while. So uh, I will uh, showcase it once I get there. So uh, uh, <laughs> Trey Ford, I, I think uh, I think that was a pretty special moment for uh, for Ryan. He, had I know he's he's watched you for the last uh, for the last few years and. Uh, see some similarities. So I, I think he feels fortunate to have, uh, have gotten by your team. So this just quickly, here's the new global logo right here on this yellow t-shirt. Um, so there's a couple of things uh, on the global side and then on the road group side, we got a new jacket um, t-shirt in a couple of different, I there's the, um, the charcoal one. I got the blue one, which is the one here. This new uh, Rotogrip Cafe style T-shirt. I'm not. I, I I don't know that I'm uh, that I'm good enough to pull off yellow. So I uh, I left that one. Uh, new uh, new uh, polos. That's the crew neck that I was talking about. There's actually two of them. Just do your uh, spell now. It's not a big yeah. deal. But placement of the ball is key. That gets a little lower than it looks like the sun on your belly. But it looks like it's high enough. I think that one's going to be good. That's a hard rock kind of take, I think. Yes. So, so anyway, that was uh, that. That was what's new from Rotogrip and uh, Global on the apparel line. Greg was saying who knew hoodies because in Dallas it's getting really close to hoodie weather now. And, uh, no, but there are new hoodies on beefandbonzi.com. Check them there out. There are. <laughs> yes, yeah, so I've been around long enough to yeah. I had the cool stuff way before it was cool. And uh, I also threw the roto grip when the X1 was actually just a <laughs> an X1, <laughs> not a ball that hooked 73 boards. Uh, so on to the balls. Yes. And we have a few in line today. We have uh, – uh, which one do you want to lead off with? Let's uh, do – I uh, I put together a little video on sc – because I was practicing on Scorpion yesterday – <clears throat> because we have the regional coming up this weekend in um, with our friend Chris Skillens up in Shawnee at Fire mm -hmm. Lake. So uh, I did a bit of a comparison between the intensity and the reality with the odd shot thrown with the UC2. So let me... Oh, no. This is why you test stuff. All right, you keep talking. I'll, All right. I'll, I'll, I'll attempt to fix this. Um, you know, we got a lot of things here, and including the intensity, which we've seen some uh, on the regular tour. It uh, The patterns we were bowling on, there's a few guys that used it. It didn't look quite as good. We did see a lot of the high road max. And since I was uh, – Chris Vi was my, uh, my random crossing buddy where I was next to him almost every week, I got to see a ton of that ball, and it did nothing but strike over and over and over <laughs> when he threw it. He, he used it from uh, the left gutter. He used it from the middle lane and didn't seem to have too much trouble uh, either way. And then out here, uh, the reality has been a uh, – that's been a constant uh, choice of both tours. Uh, so it doesn't seem to matter whether they're, they're fairly hard, uh, where they hook, whether they're a big cliff. Uh, people just like that one, <laughs> and, uh, and we're seeing it everywhere. So – yeah, I'm. Uh, yeah, I'm running into some uh, uh, issues. I'm kind of annoyed because I didn't realize. I didn't realize, and now it's kind of ruined most of this uh, point of the show. So, yeah, this is good. So anyway, yeah, uh, from what I saw uh, with the reality, uh, the reality is obviously um, the biggest. Uh, I would say it's the most popular of the super big balls in the uh in any of the ranges right now um for the professionals um it seems to be a little more continuous than the proton physics i think um i feel yeah. like the pro proton tends to get is maybe the proton might be a little bit stronger but i feel like it gets a little bit more forward um yeah and when we bowled at the U.S. Open on that last pattern and there was the speed bump and you had to get it started earlier if you weren't throwing urethane to get it be really smooth, 
that was the go-to choice. And that's what uh, Vi used at the end in the position round to get pumped up a spot uh, and, and basically set himself up to win that. So uh, uh, that was the one ball that seemed like it did get in front of it and rolled through the pins and did all the right things. And that was the, uh, that was, you know, that's where that ball fits in. It's a, it's a heavy oil killer for sure. It doesn't mind uh, any volumes. Yeah. Yeah, no, um, <clears throat> like I say, the reality off that has been used a little bit more because I think that it gets through the, like I say, it just seems to get through that front part. But, of course, <clears throat> bowling in Reno, um, they were a little bit, uh, you know, the lane surface is obviously a lot, um, n it seems like it's a lot newer um, than in um than than in most of the other places we end up going to, so yeah, it's uh, then with the um, with the intensity off that, I feel like the intensity is like very similar to a symmetrical ball for me, and um, I, um, I I find it to be it, it's less ball than I expect it to be. Um, but it's very useful um, because when I see an asymmetrical ball, I have this in my mind of what I'm going to do with it. You know, it's, it's going to be, it's going to pick up soon and I'm going to throw it hard. And, and that's not really how you can use that ball. That ball's much, it rolls and yeah. it gets in and it get and it shapes up really nice. It just isn't, it's like, it almost like it teases you by having the asymmetrical on there because it rolls for me anyway, it rolls much more like a symmetrical ball than it does an asymmetrical it's ball. Not, it's much cleaner. And uh, you can use it on some volumes where there's, some, you know, where the, where they've broken down a little bit, and still get it through the front fairly easily. Uh, players with a lot of axis rotation have really liked that as well as as the revival that was that was before it, the, the pearl version in front of it. Uh, so get two handers and, and guys that, that they get around a little bit more have really been able to get that ball to go through the front and then make it. You know, it does some backwards form on the back side. Here we go. Now I put a nice little graphic at the bottom. So we're bowling on the uh, 42 foot scorpion. And this is kind of what I was saying about the intensity. I, I felt like this part of the lane with the reality, I had to go away from it a little bit. But with the intensity, I can control it and keep it, 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 I can keep it more online and kind of play the left. Whereas if you watch this with the reality, I have to open up and get it away from it. Just because so, the ball wants to pick up so much. Um, again, here with the intensity, I, I started to try and follow it in a little bit. But it's still, it's such a smooth motion. Um, and that's what I think you're going to get out of the, the intensity. If there was one thing I would tell people, the ball is super smooth. Let me just do that so we're not fighting the volume that's better so yeah, the guys yeah. Can roll it a little bit more and you and i both you know at least can and like in this case where you're playing straighter you you get very you can have the ability to get much more end over end like that and that's where mm -hmm. that core shows up as asymmetrical where it, it goes ahead and, and locks up in the mid lane and gets it going forward and then uh and allows you to get it to hook in the oil uh for sure but uh Obviously, you can move much further left. The, the cover on the reality, that's where it shows up, how much stronger the cover is there. So they have yeah, two we, different sets, and they're complementary for sure. When, when I started to do this, I felt I felt really worried um, about – like, not worried, but having to be really careful with it. See, that's the other side of it. You get with the Rubicon, and the Rubicon's so much quicker that you can kind of not worry about it going too long because it's going to come out of it. Whereas you get something like the, re the reality, I had a lot more front to back miss when I was hooking it. Whereas with the intensity, I had a lot more front to back miss when I was going straighter. Um, you could make the the intensity work doing that. I just felt like where that ball's really good is to be able to, um, you know, create a little bit more left on these slightly longer patterns. There we go. Just just because everybody complains that you only ever put strikes in videos. Um. There we go. Back to going a little straighter and harder with the uh, 
with the intensity. And then here's one with the Rubicon. Um, yeah. Wow, I missed that one in a lot. Kind of, I guess, all the shots with the reality and the intensity burnt this lane up pretty nicely for me. Um, right. So the intensity is a little bit – it's less than both those two balls. Uh, a little And a little smoother than UC2, which is a little longer. So you're going to use it on things where, where you have a little bit more wet-dry. Uh, you have an older surface – or a little bit more look down in the front where you need, you know, you want something that, that doesn't get super early in the front, but uh, but you need to blend it out a little bit. And as I'm thinking about this, it looks like something maybe I should probably try out here. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah, maybe. <laughs> I'm going to into the bag here and get, and get things to, to even out a little bit easier. So, uh, yeah, Craig, all the balls were pretty much out of the box. I might have freshened up the surface a little bit on that intensity because I used that at. Ironically, I used that on Scorpion at the World Series. The patterns weren't it, spoiler alert, what we bowl on at the World Series isn't what we're gonna bowl on in Shawnee. Uh no, those are different patterns. <laughs> <laughs> but um we're gonna add about yeah. two to the ratio number. <laughs> so uh let me have a look. What do you go to when the fronts are burning up on my UC2 MVP pearl get through the fronts and make a hard turn? Uh, instead of rolling, that would be exactly the situation where I would like this intensity. I think it's a good step between. Um, it's hard for me because it gives a different shape to say a phase two. Um, but I would say it's a little smoother than the phase two. It's hard to kind of really explain because yeah. they kind of fit in the same spot, just doing a slightly different shape. Um, right. I know that's not necessarily helpful for everybody at home. I'm just it, it's in my the medium mind. Control, the medium control range. The cover's a little cleaner than a phase two. The core's a little probably earlier with the asymmetry than uh, than the phase two. So to get about there, the kind of the end result is not terribly different, but how to go about it is so. Uh, Dave asked an inter David asked an interesting question here. He says, "Do you find balls that work on tour works well at home on flat conditions you encounter?" I'm assuming assuming that lane surfaces um, as well. The majority on the older side. This is a fun question because it really rolls into the use uh, the uh, the RSTX one because the RSTX one works for me personally better than anything on basically everything at home and i didn't really get to use it very much on tour um the only person i really see have a lot of success with the x1 on tour is frankie um he's used it quite a few times on the tv shows um push it through the front and gets it to roll in a little different spot he also yeah, throws he uses, up more time, which is yeah really interesting that a a relative low rev rate guy for today's tour throws the lowest diff ball most of the time on those same shows. Yeah, the the, the hustles and stuff. Yeah, mm -hmm. he inspired yeah. me last week. <laughs> That's why I drilled a PDR, and ultimately why I ended up making the uh, making the step ladder was figured if Frankie was going to beat me every week, then uh, then at least I could try it. Yeah, no, I I, I, I I can really see it. And you, you can play a little bit further right than you might necessarily be able to for a little bit longer. Um, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I, he's talking about Brad Angelo. Um, maybe that's the ball you need out on tour, Chris. Because the X1... I tried it actually, but it's it's a little bit the same. It goes into the, what that question is, though, and the flatter patterns on tour versus some of the stuff at home. And the things on the, on the fifth year are way closer to those larger ratios that you see towards league. And so I have a lot of four and a half, five, five and a half inch pins. And they're both because my skill set, what I struggle with is getting it through the front. I can make it roll. Uh, I don't create length as well. So I set my drillings up to create length. Well, the one thing here is there's one, I'm on the left edge of the pattern a lot with this group versus the other one, which I've never left of the group. And so I always have oil in the front. So uh, actually I'm going over to do today is drill a couple of balls with half to one inch stronger pins than I normally use. And in some balls like the X1 that are stronger in general, uh, Aspect, X1, um, 
what's the other one I'm looking at drill and say, I'll probably drill a stronger Zen today because I'm going on C squad. And so uh, something shiny, but also with a strong enough pin that I can, uh, that I can blend it out with the ball versus trying to blend it with my hand all the time. And this comes because you had a axiom similar to that. Yeah. I, I used a, a taller, just a little over four inch axiom. And the reason I threw it was because it was the, it was the strongest feeling I had. And even that sometimes still didn't roll through some of the downlane oil. So uh, I'm looking for uh, a little more than that. So I may even go a three inch, two and a half or three inch pin and something like that X1, uh, probably way closer to leverage three and a half to four inch with a Zen. Uh, and in an aspect probably in the same kind of vein, some up, some down and try and give myself some options that, that look a lot better out here for this environment which uh, when we bowl at home, there's obviously, there's there's a lot of ratio, but the surfaces I bowl on are, are so much older that you don't need quite that strong of pins in general. I don't think, oh, well, if I start throwing these all the time, I might finally get my rotation down enough to where I can get the ball through the front all the time. We'll see. <laughs> <laughs> um, Jason was very fortunate. He won a UC2 last weekend. Uh, wondering what a good suggestion of layout would be to use in league, uh, but heavier patterns as well. Well, here's the thing. The UC2 is really clean. So depending on what type of heavier patterns you're talking about, I'm not really sure that's the ball for heavier patterns. Um, uh, both me and Chris like this uh, with lower pins with the UC2. We find that it creates a much more rounded motion. The one I was using in that video actually was an up one. But in general, I, I actually prefer to use um, I prefer to use the down one. So I use something uh, something about I think it is a five by four by four. I believe is the layout I use um, somewhere in that range. Um, it is a um, um, let me think about this now. It's a fifty by five by seventy. I think. Um, and that's the one that I've quite liked. Um, slightly stronger pin down, get the mass bias out a little bit. Um, yeah, that's that. That's been kind of the one that's been pretty good for me overall. I feel like yeah. I feel like it's a good step down. I like this question, and uh, and Stu, how are you releasing at the bottom? I think we touched on it a little bit ago, but I think the biggest difference between the top pros and and guys who are are really good and trying to get there is the difference in releases and axis rotations. In, in the video, Stu was playing to the right. And so Stu has a, a huge range that he can change his axis rotation. So because he's playing up the lane more and there's oil down lane, he's got his ball going more forward. And then as he moved in, you could see his hand going around a little bit more, creating more rotation and then more back end reaction. And so uh, that's why balls that have, really big windows and that's why that reality has worked for a lot of players. Stu can use it when he's playing straight and it'll continue through it. And as he keeps going around it, it will pick up enough to go through it as well. And, uh, and that's when you see a lot of different styles of players like in one ball, you know that uh, you have one that's hit a home run and over the years and you have balls like high road and phase two and this reality seems to be on that path as well. Uh, you know, we're seeing a lot of X ones. We're seeing, you know, there's a lot of great balls out there right now, and uh, those when several styles of players like them, then you know, you know, it's pretty good. Yeah, and one tip that I got from Pat Healy, which I uh, I, I really enjoy, is that he told me he said whether you want to go up the back of it or around the side of it, nothing happens that's positive if your thumb goes to that side. <laughs> There's never been any good bowler who's ever wanted their thumb to go past 12 o'clock. So no matter, if you think about it, Pete Weber is the most around it of almost any good bowler who's ever lived. He can have almost 90 degrees of axis rotation, and his hand goes like that. There's no, there's no scenario where the thumb goes over the top, ever. So, and, and to be honest, that's what that's what the two-handers, that's one of the things that they also, apart from grabbing it with their thumb, that's the other thing that they almost basically eradicate because it's impossible for them to go over the top of the ball because they'll drop it. Their hand has yeah. to be underneath it to be able to throw it. 
once your hand gets to up on the equator, now gravity is starting to win. And so that's two things we talked about a lot. And, and, and uh, for those of you who've been to a Mark Baker lesson, a lot of the same things. When this shoulder goes forward, this hand rolls up on top of the ball. And at that point, your leverage automatically goes down. Your rev rate goes down. And how, how much the ball hooks down lane generally goes down as with it. So uh, let me, uh, I've got, uh, let's quickly uh, move over to the high road max. Um, let me see. I'll address this where you're talking about. How, what do you think about the aspect? Aspect's a favorite ball of mine, especially to play smoother shapes. Probably uh, close to axiom, I guess. Uh, really strong in the mid lane, continues, and it kind of has the same type of shape on both lanes that are hooking and, and lanes that are pretty slick, which is what I like about it. Is, uh, it, lets me, it lets me adjust speeds and do things, and it doesn't do anything that surprises me, hardly ever. So there's yeah. big white hand. So this is me bowling on the uh, house shot. I did this a, a couple of months ago, this video, actually. Um, we're using a high road max. Um, this video is kind of long. There's a lot of strikes. I was trying to put together a ball video, and I ended up getting distracted a little bit. Um <laughs> I've got some footage with the high road nano as well. Both those balls were drilled the same. They had um, uh, they had a five and a half inch pin with like a one one and a half inch pin buffer. Um, Keep in mind, since it's a high road, that it's a much different ball in sixteen than fifteen. Yes, um, fifteen it will create more energy. It's a really strong cover. It can hook in a lot of oil. Uh, but as you watch by throw it, it's still, he's able to shape it an awful lot uh, for a ball that is very strong. Yeah, the thing for me on this was I felt like the High Road Nano was a little cleaner and a little more angular. That's Nathan Bohr to the right. I was practicing with Nathan at the time. So, um, But the, the Max, I could get it further right and it would continue. So I could really play the big angle. Like, look at that one. And yeah. and because it's smoother, it's way more continuous. So if I'd have gotten the nano to that spot, the nano would have gone very forward because it would have just hooked and you know uh, come up. So here's the nano. It just, yeah. I mean, they they were pretty easy, like to put it in perspective. But the thing that I think people like about the Max is the control it gives you. Um, well, still being able to go to create a lot, quite a bit of shape. Yeah, this one I'd actually shine the ball up um, to use it because it was just it was too strong at the bowling center where I bowl. So I was trying to like quicken it up a little bit, but also be able to use it. Um, I I personally prefer the cover um, shiny on both that and the axiom. I don't really get that much use out of the axiom when it's dull when it's shiny i find it to be really really useful for me uh with that um with that max cover on it um yeah so like i say it definitely gives you a different option uh a different shape um it's all about kind of like much more continuation um that that would be the word that that's a shiny insight um just off it uh, which I found to be a little quicker than those two uh, with it having a cleaner cover. Um, but that that's where I would be trying to use the max. I'm, if I'm trying to use the max, I'm really looking for control. Um, that's And that's where I think Chris Vi has been able to use it because Chris has got a really high rev rate. And when he's tried to use it, the two times he was really successful with it uh, that I saw, he used it a couple of times in the matches in – um, in um, in uh, Reno, but the time oh, that I saw him have his most success with it was the World Championships. Um, yeah. he he just mowed them over in the in the round robin. He could get left, and it would. And that's a place where huge angles weren't the thing, but having a ball that rolled strong through the pins was. So Kyle, by Tom Doherty, you know they bowled exceptionally well. Doherty went with a super weak ball. Uh, and then kept it online, and and Bob went the other way with a strong enough ball that he could create some angle in the front without 
going as far away from the pocket, but still could get the ball to go through the pin, which was the trick. And uh, that ball does a great job of that. He convinced me. He got me to drill one. That's for sure. Yeah. And I think uh, that yours, you drilled it with a very, uh, you drilled it with a pin in the palm. Yeah, basically mm -hmm. almost, uh, yeah, pin in the palm drilling without the hole. Uh, not quite the same without the hole. Uh, it, yeah. needs, it needs to flare a little bit more than that for me. It probably doesn't for him. <laughs> but, yeah. Yeah. I, th I think you uh, were able to control the pocket pretty good with it. You just couldn't really get it yeah. to um, go through them quite how you wanted to. And I think that that maybe uh, that polish might have quickened it up just a little bit. I don't think I would, it I would, I would move the pin up just a little bit further up on, you know, um, closer to a normal lower pin versus that. So Eddie says the max he's drilled tends to stop down lane and not seen it continue. Yeah, I've seen that. That's what I'm saying. I wouldn't, don't be afraid to slap some polish on it. Um, I think that really quickens the reaction up a little bit down the lane and gives you, uh, or at least uh, take it down, you know, 1,000, 2,000, maybe one, two, and three and get it smooth without polish. So you still have a pretty aggressive cover, uh, yeah. but not as much teeth in the front. Um, unusual at all yeah i mean i think that that's part of the whole thing with um global not necessarily having as much um of an audience when that ball came out i think that mm -hmm. the zen and the reality are really starting to change people's perspectives i'm seeing a lot of zens on the lanes i mean a lot the ball is constant it seems like it's a constant battle when i talk to pro shops about trying to get them in stock they're ordering them in eights at a time so that's uh, that's pretty cool to hear that the um, UC twos and um, and Zens are the thing that seem to be the uh, hardest for pro shops to keep in because as soon as they get them in, they've already sold them. I was speaking to uh, Gary Robinson last night, and he said that he already had uh, two or three Zens sold that weren't there. <laughs> so. From a trusted sh source of the show, I, I don't know how that is. I think he because he was well, he shot two thirty and two twenty, I think, to start today. So he must have caught a really goofy pair. Uh, I ran in a little bit of that too. There was, I mean, the scores weren't particularly high. I would imagine the last two games, though, I uh, I will be shocked if he doesn't get at least a hundred loss too. Yeah. It's just a it's a twenty five year old head and surface, so the track's really dominant. The pattern's 44 feet, but the gutter hooks. So you end up playing outside of it, but there's some pairs that hook so much to your left that you get kind of caught in the in the mix a little bit. And evidently he got crossed up like I did. I had a 175 game where I didn't strike on one lane uh, at all, the two opens, and evidently he must have caught one of those two. But the second news flash will be he's still Norm Duke and he will still strike a lot here shortly, would be my guess. Uh, Jim Jim asked a kind of interesting question. He said, um, I can see this rate you guys were talking about, uh, the bottom of release and the right rotation. Um, how do you know if the right uh, pitch and your thumb, uh, they have the right? To be honest, for me, thumb pitch is all about whether it hurts or not or whether you feel like you have to cling to hold on. If it doesn't hurt you... Yeah, one of the few things we agree on. <laughs> yeah. I mean, if it doesn't hurt right. and you're not feeling like you're holding on for dear life at the bottom, then your thumb pitch is probably right. Messing around with thumb pitches to try and create different releases, I think, causes a lot of trouble. Uh, pitches, pitches, I think it's a misnomer. I don't think they create releases. Getting in proper body positions allows you to do all those things. Uh, but, yeah, 100% with Stu, if your hand is not tearing up and you don't have any huge wear spots anywhere, uh, like I said, that hurt and bleed and whatever else, then I, your pitches are fine uh, as long as you can get out of the ball consistently and, and then work on the rest of your game, and that will increase your, your versatility and releases. Keith says, aspect and honey badger intensity for open championships too close to bring both or perfect complement. I, I I mean it really depends on how many balls you've got. Um those balls I would label in my set of heavy, medium, light. That's a heavy control ball and a medium control ball. 
So those, there's a pretty big gap in there. They, they certainly won't be overlapping each other and unless you put a lot of surface on, uh, on the intensity. It, it's going to be cleaner through the front for sure. More similar sips down lane. Uh, and so both would be in the control standpoint. So, which, which for the Open Championships isn't terrible to have. No, I got a, a reality and a, a zen to those two. And I think you have four balls that cover a large portion of what you see at the Open Championships now that there's not a breakdown squad per se. Duh. <laughs> it's Shawnee. That was the no, one thing yeah, I was it. Hey, by the way, bring your urethane this time. He didn't bring yeah. it to uh, South Plains. I went, why, why wouldn't you do that? <laughs> yeah, uh, Jake's talking. Jake's in my nationals group, um, which is almost even more, duh. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I'm uh, definitely bringing it. Yes, I'm going to try and throw it. Yes, it's probably going to tear the lane to pieces. In a, in a smaller Arsenal Mac. Uh, does that make sense to have a proton and reality? Probably not both unless you separate the, the surfaces pretty significantly. Now in a larger, you know, the, say the 10 ball set, I had both those balls for the U.S. Open. Again, we knew we were going to ball in fresh the whole time. I could gear everything. I geared everything up a little bit more because of the, the volume and the amount of time we are on the fresh. We really bowled four games on a pair, so I didn't need a lot of low-end balls. Uh, but in a, say if you're traveling to nationals and you have six balls and I'm assuming one of them is a spare ball, it probably should be, uh, you prob both of those is probably, if you're a lower rev rate player, you can have one down with more surface and one up with a little less surface and maybe separate them that way. The proton being the earlier one, the reality being the longer one, but that would be the only way I would do it. I mean, for me, it really depends on if you find yourself using your proton physics all the time, then having a reality in your bag isn't the end of the world. But if you're like, you don't really use the proton that much, then like for me, if you use a phase two all the time, having an idol as well was a good option because, okay. because they were like slightly different. And yeah. that's kind of how I feel about the proton and the reality. You should base your bag about the balls that you use a lot, especially if you're not bowling like, you know, if you're doing it, you know, you bowl league and whatever, and you you want to try and maximize your chances of doing well, having a couple of balls around the ball that you use all the time is a good idea. If yeah. you use like three balls in league every week, you know, you make the change every game, then probably it's not. But if you can use your reality for most of the night, Having a proton isn't a bad idea. That's that's kind yeah. of the way I look at it. With you just want them to be different. The proton you want to set up to be sooner because that's what it wants to be. That's all. I, mean, I would I would make sure that the proton has a little bit more surface. Say USB C. If you're a little speed dominant in general, you can gear that way for sure and have the, both those balls because they do shape a little differently. So for me, it wouldn't make sense to have both of them. Uh, but Sue's got a fantastic point. It, it, if you most of your stuff ends up being on the more aggressive end, then it makes way more sense too. Like the guy who you bowled with, uh, yes, um, you were bowling with uh, uh, the guy from Seattle. Uh, his son bowls. Who's on your cross? Owens. On... Oh, Russ Hunt. Russ Hunt. Russ yeah, Hunt. Yeah. yeah. See, Russ throws it pretty firm. Mm -hmm. He's using the proton physics. Him having a reality off that proton physics, even if they've got almost the same layout. Wouldn't be a bad option because if he's if he flat tends with one, he could go to the other. Not necessarily any logic to why it would work, but they would be a good a combo. Longer, a little more continuous, and that's where he ran into trouble. He went from there, and I think he went to a black widow, and it was just so much longer he couldn't get it to pick up. Exactly. The proton got too early and a little smooth, and the next gap was too big. And for him, he doesn't need a lot of weak balls. So, yeah, because he's he ended up going from there to go into his two handed arsenal. And then that yeah. didn't work out as well. No. But, uh, but, but, uh, but that, that, that's kind of just an example of someone who I, I saw it yesterday. He was using a proton physics, throwing it pretty hard. And, you know, 
having another ball off that. And, th- and that can also be, you can just have a pin up and a pin down proton. Right. You know, just separate one, 500, 1,000, one, 1,000, one, 2,000. You can do it that way. This is the same question. It's just the opposite. If you're a rev dominant player, the, say two handers that have soft speed. And so, you know, if you need, if most of the time you're throwing pitch black and you need lower end balls or balls that don't hook like a Jacob or like, like a lot of two handers that don't have a ton of ball speed. Or lefties. Uh, yeah. Or lefties. I, I think you can certainly gear towards having another option in that arena. It makes, it makes a lot of sense. Same well, idea. Having if six balls. If you're flying with six balls, also, if you're going to use if you're going to use a spare ball, half your arsenal being urethane or plastic is kind of that could be you a little be really rev dominant, <laughs> or you can yeah. get really shut out in a hurry. <laughs> yeah. So, okay, well, um, what what uh, you're on? What time today, Chris? I'm on at five o'clock today. Uh, so scores are actually higher on that than I anticipated. It looked like there was a lot of hook and a lot of oil down lane, but overall, not as many of the top scores, but way more in the cut. There's like 14 off that squad in the cut. So evidently it's there to get. Uh, but when you have you have that much traffic, it's it's kind of old school. We don't do it anymore on the regular tour, but the challenge is pair to pair and figuring out how much more and how much less each pair of hooks. So so just from perspective, Walter Ray has almost caught Duke already. I would not have guessed that in any world. <laughs> Watching Norm throw yesterday, he looked like he, he had Robo Robo Duke going on. He was so just flush, Walter flush, flush. Ray was uh, 236, and where was Pete Thomas? Pete Thomas was 182. And now Pete Thomas is 320. So Pete shot 140 over this morning. 140? Is that after four or five? It's hard to say. After four. Okay. And then Walter Ray shot um, 160. So the scores haven't really been very high. They're not crazy. Chris Keene was in that same range. He shot 270 the last game to get to 300. So, And he had one game in between there that was relative average <laughs> uh, um, in between a lot of really good games. So uh, – uh, Lasko is 285. What was he yesterday? He was 250 starting, so this morning he hasn't gone very so he's well. He's only shot 27 over this morning. Um, yeah, I think it's easy to get stuck there because that puddle in the in the track is really deep. I had to throw it really slow. I had a pretty fresh thousand pad on that Axiom. I was not being very nice to it. And I still had a couple of lanes where I threw it pretty good, you know, sliding like 18, 19, so I'm laying it down on about 12. I'm looking at 11, <laughs> and I two-pinned a few times. So, uh, yo, all right. Well, if he was bowling for me right now, I'd feel pretty good about it. He's not struggling at the moment. Uh, no. No. Somebody's no. figuring it out. <laughs> and his sponsor's happy about that. <laughs> <laughs> probably last two or three weeks. Now he gets to take on you big boys this weekend where he basically goes to the tour stop, which is called the Southwest Region. Uh, and, uh yeah. It's a little it's it's a little less this time though. You and Frankie aren't bowling. Oh, uh, okay. Well, I mean that's one okay. cash spot left. So, you know. Yeah. But so yeah. we'll see. Uh, yeah, it'll, it'll be interesting. I think uh, it's been fun to watch that part, uh, and it takes a village. So uh, we're pretty lucky. The bowling community has been very helpful uh, in, in helping him and giving him some advice so he doesn't have to listen to me all the time, which is overbearing for anyone, as you know, if you listen to the show all the time. So, uh, <laughs> welcome back to the board. The board has made an appearance again. Uh Back by Papa Land. There we go. All you have to do is go away for a while. So, yeah, we'll try and make a run tonight, see what happens. Uh, gosh, what Thursday will be tricky for me. So, uh, hopefully. Yeah, I think I might one. find, I might try and find a guest for Thursday. It was a little rough by myself last week. It, it, 
I, I admire your your uh, your ambition, but I think being calling Cowherd is maybe a little bit harder than uh, than. Uh, it, it wouldn't be. It, it was. It wouldn't have been. It wouldn't be so bad on a Tuesday. Tuesday's yeah. easier because something's happened over the weekend. Right. Thursday, yeah, it was a little rough. I thought I did well till my wife went, man, you were awkward AF. <laughs> you guys don't struggle to be honest with each other. I'll give you that. So, uh, um, a lot of, not, not a lot of your things, although my son probably will have a couple. Uh, yeah, I mean, how have you have a UFO in there? Yeah, uh, yes, sir. I, I think you remember that one being pretty good for a little while. Yeah, the UFO and the um, I've got my scam balls for Shawnee. I've got my UFO, I've got my Omega Crooks. Um, might even revive that proton physics a little bit. Um, and then, um, yeah, and then it'll be the usual suspects. So, a couple Having of years early balls there hasn't, hasn't been a disadvantage. In over the years, especially early. I've it's done way fun. better in Shawnee since I dropped trying to be Stu and started trying to be Sean Rash in there. Well, and there's a lot of because, sense. Because Sean bowls unbelievably well in that bowling center. And I do not. I've had a little luck from right of second arrow. Not as much from when I try and hook it there. It's, it's a, a lot more hit and miss for me. So, uh, one last question about Paul, since that's really what we're here for, but how strong is a Rubicon? I think this is a really good question because it, it, it is a little bit confusing, I think, even to us, because the cover is not super early, but the core is really strong, especially if you roll it a little bit like we do, because uh, it gets through the front easier than some of these other big balls, but it is really strong in the mid lane. And... Uh, Considering it's it's a great compliment to the UC two because it's a solid four to five feet earlier in the mid lane than the UC two is. So a more rounded shape, but it does still get through the front. For me, I like the Rubicon when I'm not giving it away so much, you know. But playing like you need you're playing inside, say nationals, you're playing inside, you can't get the ball way far right of the head pin to get it back, but you still need to hit, and it rolls really strong through that spot where the UC two does let you separate and and create a lot more shape. Yeah, I mean, the thing with it is, is the weight block is so dynamic that mm -hmm. it, it, it really depends on the layouts. I personally thought that the Rubicon was going to be a ball that everybody was going to use on tour, like, all the time. And it, 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 it hasn't been as much as I expected, I'll be honest. I it just, it, it, it's such a unique shape. Um, so, yeah. Be Jeff Fair? Mm-hmm. All right. And the good and the great, Mr. Robert Eddy from Lightning Strikes and Fort Myers. Always good to see him. Uh, here's here's one of my fun questions. I'm not I'm not really picking on you here, Matthew. I just don't really like the term better. Better for. They each have a spot because they are separate balls. If I'm bowling first arrow, then the Rubicon. If I'm bowling fifth arrow, then probably the UC2. Um, <laughs> but – it, it really depends. Like, I personally have more use for the UC2 than the regular Rubicon. But if we're bowling on something where I needed the ball to roll, then, you know, roll and be smooth, then the UC2 is useless at the, in, that, in that spot. Quite equally, right. if I'm at game six and I'm throwing it over the left gutter and I've got to get it to, like, six, the Rubicon's useless for doing that. So... It, that, that's last so week, different. On eight to one last week, the Rubicon is much better than the UC two is because UC two wants to come off the hook too much, mm -hmm. and, it, and it's really clean. Uh, so in that case, it's the other way around. This week it might be it might flip a little bit. So we'll find yeah. out tonight. So yeah, it sounds <laughs> like people are playing a little bit further left. Weird. That's never happened before ever. No, no one on eight. That's why a squad is normally not the best one because. Everybody moves deeper every day, and then instead of B squad being the absolute Jones, it ends up getting chopped up in the middle and not being so defined. But 
with the pattern shape being pretty defined, it shouldn't be as much of an issue here. So, um, yeah, last question, and we'll, we'll cut it off here in an hour, but uh, more success with asymmetrical or symmetrical equipment. And this is dependent on the player, I think, but go ahead. Um, it really, it's for me, it depends on what we're bowling on. Like if I'm bowling at home on easier stuff, I have way more success with asymmetrical equipment. Um, I feel like it blends out the wet dry better. And my miss is way more in the oil than it is anything else. So if I use a ball that means that when I miss in the oil, I'm screwed, then I'm screwed. <laughs> yeah. So that's why I tend to see myself using, like I've had a lot of success over time with like hypercells, um, uh, the uh, Defiant Soul, um, the the X1 right now is obviously the the goat for me um, in that ter in those terms. Um, so, uh, what's my favorite of each right now? Um, I would say my favorite symmetrical ball is probably the Phase Two. Um, my favorite asymmetrical ball, um, I mean. If we're bowling on tour, it's probably the reality. If we're bowling on everything else, it's definitely the X1. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, um, and Sue's opened my eyes a little bit to this too because I was not an asymmetrical fan in general, and it's because I mostly rolled it and I don't get around as much. Now my rotation seems to increase more because of environment, and and I started moving some uh, mass biases out close to the VAL, which let them keep a shape that worked much better. Uh for me, which also Stu put me on. So uh, I used to think asymmetric was way more to create shape down lane, but for me, it mostly just locked up and went forward. And so I, I think guys get around a lot, it does create more shape. For guys who roll it more, it works way more like Stu's talking about, where it allows it to pick up in some spots in the oil where symmetrical balls sometimes do not. And so uh, I've always been way more asymmetrical than asymmetrical. Uh, and still prefer that just in general, but uh, I certainly, it's way closer to 50 50 than it's been in a long time. Yeah. And with, with, and like with the way patterns are being designed and stuff, and they're often being a little bit more shape in the patterns than what, I think that that's leaning towards more people using asymmetrical balls than symmetrical balls. But yeah, we'll see. All right, guys. Well, thanks for tuning in. Um, I will try and put something together for Thursday. Um, oh, damn, forgot. We have a bet. Our show and sweep the rack, we have a bet. So right. Bill is playing against Frankie in the playoffs. Um, so me and Big Mike have had a bet because, you know, we're both cheerleaders, basically. At least Mike has a real job. I'm a professional bowler. I'm still Frankie's cheerleader. So... <laughs> Um, he's, he's obviously got Bill and I've obviously got Frankie. And, um, so the, uh, forfeit, um, if we, uh, if, uh, the beef and Barnsley show, AKA Frankie wins, uh, big Mike has to do a, uh, entire episode of sweep the rack in a beef and Barnsley t-shirt. If, uh, Bill wins, um, uh, Mike gets to, um, design the he board. Gets the board? Yeah. <laughs> um, so uh, yeah, that's that's how it is. Um, I feel like uh, I got the advantage of the players at the minute because I've got the hot hand. Although Bill Houdini O'Neill seems to be blessed in the playoffs at the minute, so maybe maybe I didn't. And um, yeah, guys, on, guys on house money are dangerous. That's for sure. Yeah, so if if Frankie does win, and we'll find out in a couple of weeks, I need you guys to share the shit out of the Sweep the Rack show, so that because you know, so we can get that number up of people watching, um, so we can see the Beef and Barzi show uh, T-shirt in all its glory. Um, so. <laughs> we will also have a contest coming up here soon on my finish in Aberdeen, North Carolina. Uh, and so look for those details. Perhaps Thursday we'll, we'll have that nailed down. And uh, the winner of that will get a Honey Badger Intensity, uh, care of Niner Global and the Beef Barnsley Show. So uh, uh, look for those details and uh, try not to pick me to finish 58th. Um, 
Wow, there's some. Um, or I just hope it'll make you right if you do. How's that? So, <laughs> how's this? The the fr- fr- the the, the beef and Barnsley fans are coming in in their droves. There we go. Oh, Frankie all the way. If Bill Bowles like he did this week, he'll get eaten up by Frankie, and Frankie will win. Won't even go to a roll off. There you go. Well, the people have <laughs> spoken. Go, Frank. Our people have anyway. So, yeah. all right. Well, thanks for joining us uh, on this real talk review. And uh, once again, support all those bowling centers and those places that are open up. They're going to need some help getting through summer, uh, especially the ones that just got a late start. So uh, tell leagues to get back on the floor, keep these places open so we have a place to compete and to uh, bowl league and have some fun. So, And then when you get a chance, uh, please support the people who uh, support us uh, when you get a choice. We'd appreciate it. So Storm, Rotogrip, our Global, Vice, Coolwick, 3G Shoes, Master, Bowling Smart, and Mark Baker Bowling. So. Uh, Until next time, stay safe, stay healthy. God bless.